first presenter in this session, and this is session number five. For those of you who are following along on Yorn and who want to ask a question, uh, Jack Stoddard is the Chief Operating Officer of Accolade. Please welcome him. So before they let me come out on the stage, they made me make a promise. And the promise was that I wouldn't be a futurist, that I wouldn't come out and talk to you about what healthcare is going to look like in 2020. Uh, and so they made me promise that I would focus on what's happening today, talk about what large employers in this country are doing, the companies that we're privileged to serve, like Comcast and Lowe's and Hewlett Packard, are doing today to transform the healthcare system. And although they didn't, so I made the promise I wouldn't be a futurist, but they didn't make me promise I wouldn't be a historian. So I want to start in 1862. This is the USS Cumberland. This is the ship that dominated the seas for decades at the time. It was built of oak, it had masts, it had sails, and it had 54 guns. And when the Civil War had broken out uh, a year before, the majority of the naval assets had ended up in the hands of the Union. And they took these ships and they strung them on what they called Plan Anaconda. And they put them from Northern Virginia down around the tip of Florida all the way to Texas. And these were the dominant ships that had protected the seas for decades before. And on the morning of March 8th in 1862, the commander of the Cumberland stood out and looked into the waters just north of Norfolk, Virginia, and saw the strangest ship coming towards him. It was this ship. It was the USS Virginia. At the time, it, it was unlike any ship that had ever sailed the seas. It had no masts, it had no sails. And the commander, very confident about his business model, his existing ship, said, all we have to do is fire at the broadside and we'll sink this ugly ship that's steaming towards us. And so that's what they did. They fired at it. And to the commander's surprise, what happened was the cannonballs bounced off the side of this iron ship. Shortly thereafter, a new form of warfare took place. And this ship that had dominated the seas for years was sunk. The rest of the ships on the Anaconda barricade had immediately become obsolete. And I share this story with you because in a lot of ways, the designers of this ship in Virginia had a decision to make. They started by taking the existing framework of this ship, which was the USS Merrimack. This ship was a Union ship that they had scuttled as the war began and it sank to the harbor. And the shipbuilders for the Confederates had a decision, right? Do we take this existing platform off the floor of the the harbor, and do we put on masts and sails, or do we rethink this completely? They knew that they were outgunned. They knew that they didn't have enough ships to fight the battle ship for ship. So in a very short time, they began redesigning the ship completely. They took an existing platform, and upon it, they built a very different business model. And I share this because in a lot of ways, the employers in this country are in a very similar situation as the shipbuilders in Virginia. Right? They feel outgunned in the war against the rising health care costs. They feel like they don't have enough resources to think about how to approach the health care system and get more value out of it. And the stakes are high for these employers. The companies that we work with are spending a billion dollars a year on health care. Think of that, a billion dollars a year. Many large employers are spending hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is, this is before, in addition to the amount that their consumers are paying, their employees are paying. So it's a huge expense for these folks. And the crazy part is that 30 to 40% of that spend is being wasted. It's being wasted on the over, under, or misuse of the healthcare system. If you think about that, any other business process that these big employers have that's hemorrhaging three to $400 million a year, they'd be all over, right? They'd have consultants on it, they'd be looking at lean and Six Sigma projects, and they'd be wringing the waste out of that system. The problem in healthcare is that it's not a standard process. Right? It's a process of one. It's a process of a consumer and the decisions that they make as they interface with the healthcare system. Think about the decisions you've had to make when you have been thrust into the healthcare system. For me, you know, I thought I knew a lot about healthcare. I thought I spent all my time in it. I've been in this career for a long time. And in March of 2006, I was thrust into the healthcare system. My, my wife and I, who was seven months pregnant, 
she and I went on our trip from Minneapolis to Washington, D.C. to see some friends. We were going on a, on a Friday. We were going to come back on Sunday. And at 2 o'clock in the morning on Saturday night, she wakes me up and says her water had broken. She'd been having a healthy pregnancy at that point, And right then, at 2 o'clock in the morning, we're thrust into the system. And I thought I knew a lot about this. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, the decisions that we made together had a huge impact on the care. We had to decide where to go. Right? That's the first thing. We had to figure out where to access the system. And once we got in there, I think about all of the different things. I needed information. I needed to know how to talk to my doctor in the emergency room. I then was, we were admitted to the high-risk pregnancy ward, and we ended up staying in this hospital for about a month total. And I had to find a doctor. I had to get information. Together, we had to have conversations. I became a crash course in perinatology. And then when our daughter was born, Alexandra, and was put in the NICU, you know, it started all over. Then I had to become an expert on neonatology, and there's all of these clinical decisions that we were facing, and they just continued, right? Because at that point, we had to get discharged, and we had to get back home, and we had to then tie it into our existing care plan. We had to listen for the monitors at night, give her the med, right? There's all these clinical decisions. And on top of that, I don't know about you, but I was standing there looking at this beautiful daughter, Alexander, who's fine, by the way. She's not going to be a scary story here. She's, she's fine and doing well. She's nine years old now. But as I'm standing there for the first time with these terrifying feelings, these proud feelings, these feelings, these emotions of love as a new dad and being terrified and scared and all of these things, this woman comes up next to me and she's not wearing scrubs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, maybe she's a social worker, somebody to actually ask how I'm doing. And she was from the finance department. And she, called, she stopped by to tell me as I'm looking at this isolette that the hospital was in network, but the providers were out of network. And I needed to come and figure out how I was going to pay for this. So the decisions that consumers make are crazy. So as we started to look at figuring this out, we did a lot of design research and began thinking about this problem um, from the consumer perspective. right? So what, while every healthcare decision is unique and every journey through the healthcare system is independent of that person, what we found is that there's some consistencies around how consumers make healthcare decisions. The first is most consumers don't think about their healthcare benefits or the healthcare system until they need it. They're more focused on their jobs and on their families and on the things that make them happy. And when they get thrust into it, it's usually at the worst time, right? They're scared, they're anxious, they're confused. And then they're faced with these dual complexities. One is the complexity of healthcare administration. What's going to be covered? What's it going to cost? Where do I go who's in network? And then the other side of this equation is the complexity of the healthcare delivery system. And what we found is that consumers who are scared and anxious and confused make a series of errors, right? They go to the emergency room when they could have gone in the urgent care. They go to the, a specialist when they could have gone to primary care. Or they don't comply with their doctor's care plans because um, it's not because of just knowledge gaps. It's also because of the social, emotional, logistical, financial barriers that get in the way. And so as we started to think about this, we also did a lot of consumer research as we were designing our company. And we said, tell us about your experience. And not surprising what we heard from consumers is that it's too hard, it's too complex, the healthcare system's too fragmented. And so we took a page out of other complex consumer markets. And what we saw is that when any time there's high importance to a consumer and high complexity to a consumer, this notion of a professional emerges. Right? Think of it. You wouldn't go navigate the legal system without a lawyer next to you. But as we plotted healthcare, I think we'd all agree that it's probably more important than anything. Right? More important than your retirement. More important than your finances. But yet, the equivalent didn't exist. So this is the white space that we're trying to solve by giving every family an equivalent professional health assistant. And that's what these large, innovative employers are doing to try to get more value out of the system. Every family gets their own health assistant. It is somebody who knows them, knows their family, who works for them, and whose job is to help them navigate the healthcare system, help them understand how their benefits work, help them get more value out of this very fragmented delivery system. You can call them and ask simple questions like, what's going to be covered or what's this going to cost me? You can secure message with them and ask them to help you find a doctor. There's, there's doctors, nurses, pharmacists, psychologists on the team who are able then to help you prepare for those visits, help you navigate the system more appropriately, help you get the most out of 
your interactions with your care provider. And they're also there to help you address the contextual, emotional, logistical, social issues that often get in the way. The currency they operate with is trust. Right? When you have somebody who knows you, knows your family, and is available to be with you through that entire journey, regardless of what your conditions are, regardless of what stage of care you have, we're finding that you can apply influence sciences much more appropriately. This is Mary. Mary is married to her husband, who you see here, who works for NBC Universal. Uh, he's one of the employers who is trying this new approach to healthcare. For the 11 years before Mary got to her health assistant, she had been um, suffering from chronic pain. She'd been bouncing around the healthcare system. She'd been misdiagnosed six times. She had severe back pain, so severe that she could barely get out of bed. She was on a multiple medications. She was seeing different specialists. And she was about to go and get a very risky and what turned out would have been an unnecessary surgery. Her health assistant was able to listen to her, understand her, help her assess her options, and find for her a second opinion. The second opinion was able then to look at her hips. It turned out she had bone on bone. She was able to get a hip replacement, and the health assistant stayed with her through that journey, helped her get her family ready for when she came home, and lo and behold, her life got back on track. She's now going, she now was recently diagnosed with breast cancer, and her health assistant is now with her through that experience because it's a different set of specialists, a different set of decisions, a different set of preferences that she's now going to have to evaluate in the course of that treatment. We do this over 10,000 times a month, a million interactions a year that we're having with consumers to help them get more value out of the healthcare system. And sometimes they start with things where somebody's just calling to say, hey, help me understand how my benefits are going to change this year. And if you have trust with them and you can listen and ask questions, you know, we talked to Ray recently, and Ray said, well, hypothetically, if somebody needs to go into rehab, how would my benefits work? And with you have trust and relationship, you're now with that person through their journey to get sober and to go through rehab and then deal with any other health care issue. Sometimes people will engage with their health assistant to say, hey, I'm on my way to the emergency room. What's it going to cost me? And when the health assistant talks to them and says, what's going on? How is that going to work? You find out that they had tried to get to their primary care doctor, but their physician was on vacation, and the primary care doctor couldn't accept appointments for two more days. So she, knowing their body, they said, I need to get to the hospital. Health assistant says, do you mind if I call your primary care doctor? And is able to translate the consumer situation into clinical terms and say, here's what's going on with your patient. And they say, well, why didn't she say so? <laughs> right? Consumers aren't equipped to do that. So what we're finding is that these health assistants are able to help get more value out of the healthcare system. So let me show you the results. First of all, there's a lot of talk about population health these days. But when you really unpick that, you really focus on a small subset of the population, a subset who are typically high cost or high risk or chronic. And while those are important, what we found is that when you can engage the majority of the families, so the way that the, by giving consumers a product that they want that's easy to access, you know, their own health assistant, one number to call, one website to go to, one mobile app or somebody who you know in the system, we can engage 90% of the health, the families driving 90% of the healthcare spend. What's fascinating is that two-thirds of the time we're engaging these families before they enter the system. So then they're able to access in the right place, get the care that they need for their families, and then comply with their doctor's care plan because the health assistant's supporting them in driving out these contextual factors that get in the way. These large employers are getting a lot more value out of the healthcare system. So we're consistently saving them between 5 and 15% on care. So if you think about that round numbers, 10% of a billion dollars, it's $100 million of value that's being created for these large employers. They're getting more value just by helping their families use the system more appropriately and get more value out of their benefits. As you can imagine, a lot of these big employers want to know, does an oak ship compared to an iron ship. So what we'll do is do a pilot and control or a clinical trial. We'll take half of the population and we'll, we'll give them a health assistant. We'll take the other half and let them you know, provide, get the services they typically get from their health plans or self-navigating through the healthcare system. And you can see the, the, the utilization metrics are pretty striking. 
To control, admissions per thousand went up 3%. With the health assistant, it goes down by 10%. That's a 13% difference. You can see it on inpatient days, a 20% difference in terms of inpatient days. Readmissions, a 15% a difference. ER visits per thousand, 6, 7% difference. CT scans, the same. We see this in every population that when you give somebody the personal support resources and information that they need and address these contextual factors, that they not only have lower costs, but they're getting better care. The final thing is we find that consumers love this, right? Having somebody who knows you is easy to access, who knows your family and is able to support you through these complex situations, you end up getting better satisfaction. So let me close by just encouraging you to go back, as you go back to your ships, your port of call, wherever that may be, and you get back on your bridge of your ship, that you start to apply these design principles. I would encourage you to think that your existing model is obsolete. I would encourage you to think about applying design principles that put the consumer first. Think about their entire journey through this healthcare experience, because I think you can find that there are ways that you can extract tremendous amounts of value and recreate a new ship that will allow us to deal with the changing healthcare landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack.